So what we're trying to do is make them forget mm -hmm. where the bite is used to go. Mm -hmm. And then once we know that the patient is deprogrammed, then we need to reprogram the patient into a new bite that we're uh -huh. going to be creating. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jenny, and I'm a part of education team at Medit. Nice to meet you, everyone. And today we have Dr. Hector at Costa Long. Hi, Hi nice to meet you. Good to see you, Jenny. Yeah. All good. Thank you. So how have you been doing? All good. All good. We're, we're really working on this. So uh, I think this webinar is going to be really interesting for <laughs> everyone. It's a kind of part two of a part yeah. one that we already did. So it's a, it's a continuing education, really. No, oh, yeah. Last time I asked you uh, the difference between deep programming and reprogramming, and Dr. Hector prepared a very interesting topic this time, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So many dentists will be so eager to learn more about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I hope it's interesting. I think it's a, it's a really broad topic, and I try to concentrate the part of deep programming Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about it, I think it's, and the good thing is we're going to do like a live session. So we're going to do it uh, yeah. now. I think it, that's going to be really interesting as well. Yeah, from this time, I'll be attending the lecture together from the beginning and I'll be asking the question on the behalf of the listeners. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Sherry, you started, Doctor? Yeah. Great. So... Thank you for joining me today. Uh, Jenny, thank you very much for um, helping me with, the, with those webinars. We'll be talking today a bit more about splints. We already did talk about splint last time. And these are the kind of splints that we had before. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to see if we can uh, see something. Can you see the laser? Yeah, I can. Uh, that's great. So with this laser, I'll be pointing a few things that I think uh, the attendees will be looking at and we can see together where yeah. this presentation is pointing. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of splints that we talked about last time. This time I'll be talking a bit more about deep programmers. So the deep programmers are, are going to be showing a workflow, the workflow that I use. We're going to see when and why we're going to be using this kind of deep programmers. This is some... Uh, anterior bites um, that MediSplint app can do. So those are the kind of splints that you can do as deep programmers with a platform in the front. And I'll be showing how to do them, um, how to design them as well. And then considering the printing part of it, I think the first part we already talked about printing. This is more about understanding when and why using this kind of um, D programmers. Then on the why part of it, and why do we use them? Why do I want this anterior byte, anterior D programmer? The most important part here is to understand that these little devices help us, is gonna, they are going to help us to diagnose if we have any problems in the joints. So the joint is this part here. We're going to talk a bit about anatomy in the joint as well. But yeah. we need to understand that if there is any problem here, this little device is going to help us uh, to know, well, there is a problem or the joints are fine. Then the second kind of part uh, on why we use them is to check if there is stability in the joint because some joints are not healthy, they are destroying themselves or they're just not in the right position, then mm -hmm. this little device is going to help us as well. Another thing that it does is relaxing the muscles. We're going to see that why as well. It's going to help us with a starting point if we want to do a, like a complex case, if we want to do a, a big case, or if we're not really sure if the bite is right, this is a perfect time to use these kinds of deep programmers. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to help us to sit the condyles in the right position. So this is just a bit about me. Um, yeah. I changed the picture, but... Uh, isn't... I haven't changed much uh, since last presentation. So I'm a general dentist working in Malaga. Uh, I've been working for, sorry. I've been working for uh, a few years now and I graduated and I went straight to the UK. I've worked with Dr. Ian Buckle in this um, talking, I mean, and I do some courses um, in occlusion. So we are 
trying to share a bit the expertise that we got in occlusal splints and then uh, joint health and joint position. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been doing a great job in Copenhagen and, and Denmark yeah, and in the UK. And I'm trying to do this in Spain as well. I think if at some point I could go to South Korea, that would be amazing. But yeah. until then, uh, I think we can do some webinars and uh, that will be good enough. <laughs> So um, continuing into scanning, scanning has a really potential uh, cost and time effectiveness when we scan. If we are thinking about introducing the scanner in our clinic, it's going to help us reducing the distortion of the impression materials and also the time-wise because patient comes in, first time we do is scanning the patient. As soon as we scan the patient, we can start designing the splint. And this is going to help us with big treatment cases. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to be more comfortable with the with the patient, of course, because we don't have these materials that go into our mouth. I mean, that's well known already that scanners is part of the future. It's not something that it's not even part of the future. It's part of the present. It's not something uh, that we need to avoid anymore. It's something that we need to introduce in our clinic if we want to move forward in these kind of things. It's going to give us an immediate evaluation uh, of the impressions, the impression is okay or not. Yeah. Because sometimes we take an impression, we send it to the lab, and then the lab says, well, that's not yeah. too good of an impression. So scanners help with this. And then it's also so easy to store because nowadays we have hundreds of patients, hundreds of records that we need to keep for five years, sometimes even more. Uh, ideally, we want to have those stored somewhere. Mm -hmm. So today what I'm trying to do is organize this as in an agenda. Uh, we're going to try understanding what's the muscle deprogramming and reprogramming, because that sounds like, what is he talking about? Yeah. We're going to try and understand that part. Then we're going to see when is it important to do it or not, and when we don't need it to do it. Mm -hmm. The methods to do it um, and the type of splint that we can use. Not only we can use splint, but we can, also, um, but we can use all the kind of deprogrammers. Then we're going to see uh, which is the most appropriate splint in each case. We're going to see how to manage the patient expectation because some patients think that we're going to solve their life with these kind of deprogrammers. Yeah. We're not, but we're going to see how we can help the patient. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to see how we're going to introduce this is a, um, and integrate this is a, in a big treatment plan. If we're going to do a big case. We're going to see how this device is going to help us. So for the first part would be the reprogramming, deprogramming part. Yeah, this part. Yeah, this part. So the first thing that we need to understand is the joint, the mm -hmm. anatomy that we got in the joint. So each one of us uh, is the same, yeah. considering that we have a healthy joint. I can't really go into detail, and we could do another webinar into not healthy joints or oh. problems in the disc or yeah. things like that get really complex when we get into that part mm -hmm. but with healthy joints the only thing that we need to understand is this is the glenoid fossa mm -hmm. and then inside that fossa we have a condyle which is part of the mandible mm -hmm. in between these two we have a disc mm -hmm. and we got, we got some retrodiscal tissue so this muscle that you can see here um, this is the lateral pterygoid so this is the muscle that's going to allow the joint to move forward. Mm -hmm. That muscle needs to be as relaxed as possible so the condyle is seated in the right position. Where most of the patients have this muscle a bit active. So mm -hmm. if that muscle is slightly active, the joint is not in the right position. It can be a bit forward. And some patients, they don't have any symptoms, but some others, they do have symptoms. So we're going to see those kind of patients that have muscle symptoms, but not joint issues. And mm -hmm. we're going to see what the big difference between them two. And we've got some articles here talking about muscle memory because patients, when they try to bite in the normal bite, they mm -hmm. kind of they kind of have a, a memory in their brain that mm -hmm. they're always going to go into the same position where they're mm -hmm. biting, the way they used to bite. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know if they're in the right position because they're used to it. Mm -hmm. And then they feel comfortable. Some feel comfortable, others don't. And we're going to see that they do have a chewing pattern. So some patients, they when they chew, 
um, they're always going to do the same movement because teeth are going to dictate where the joints that and they're going to be. If mm -hmm. my teeth are forward, then the, the joint needs to be forward. If the teeth are back, then the joint needs to be back. Mm -hmm. And then we need to know that this is a healthy joint. We cannot go into really complex cases. This is simple. Mm -hmm. Joints are healthy. The only way to know if the joints are healthy is there's no sharpening pain or there's no mm -hmm. tension in the joints up here. Yeah. Okay? So we talked about why, why we're going to use this. So those are the five kind of points that we're going to be seeing that why. But then when do we use this? Though that's a, that's an important one. When do I want to use this, Hector? Is it for uh, just healthy joints? Well, mm -hmm. ideally, yes. We need patients with healthy joints. But if they don't have healthy joints, they're going to give us a feedback. And then we know as a diagnostic tool, that this is no good for them to use. So that's that's one part of it. Mm -hmm. Then we can use it orthodontics. If we're going to change... Um, the way the patient uh, al alignment, the, the alignment in the patient teeth, then we can use this kind of device. If we have any muscle symptoms, if we're going to do a full mouth rehabilitation on an impatient with heavy bruxism, I think that's a good thing to use. So, so will you deprogram every patient? So you, you can deprogram every patient, but if the patient don't don't have any symptoms, I don't think it's necessary. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that every patient needs to be deprogrammed. Just in patients that you either gonna be doing orthodontist, mm -hmm. full mouth rehabilitation, if they have any symptoms of they are really heavy bruxes. So those are the three, four cases that I'll be using these kind of devices. Mm -hmm. Overall, the main thing that you need to understand is when we're going to change the patient occlusion, if we're going to do a, just a simple filling, and we probably don't need this kind of devices, but if we're going to do a big case, then ideally, yes, uh, using this kind of patient. Um, so before moving on, um, yeah. can you explain more about deep programming and reprogramming? So that we yeah, can- so Yeah, so deep programming, what we're trying to do is uh, make the patient forget uh, where the muscles and the joint, uh, where the muscles are programmed to be, sorry. So the joints can sit in the right position. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when we tell the patient, when we talk about the programming, that means make the patient, uh, so they are programmed to do the same. That's a muscle memory. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is make them forget mm -hmm. where the bite is used to go. Mm -hmm. And then once we know that the patient is deprogrammed, then we need to reprogram the patient into a new bite that we're ah, going to be creating. Got it. So that's the whole concept of deprogramming the patient. We're really okay. deprogramming the muscles mm. to reprogram the patient again into a, oh. another a scheme. They're going to be working in a different scheme. Mm. Yeah, I think that everyone also got the idea. Yeah, because I got it. Everyone got it. <laughs> okay, that's great. Yeah. So moving on, uh, the method on how to deprogram the patient or the muscle of that patient. Ideally, and this is the studies that many years ago we had this some studies. You got some um, on the bibliography that I, that I had. When we have a midpoint splint, so something that's in between the teeth, most anteriorly, the more anterior you have something the more it's going to deprogram the muscle. The activity of the muscle is going to be reduced so the condyles can sit in the right position. So anything that's a midpoint splint that goes in the middle, that's going to help us. The NTIs, B splint, or coit programmers, those are just names. They're not my names. That the names that have been used um, uh, for those kind of deprogrammers. But really, these kind of deprogrammers, the patient is wearing it. Mm -hmm. And they can take it at them at home or not. Where the lift gates and the lucidity, we talk about this in the other webinar as well. Mm -hmm. It's something interior as well, but they cannot wear it. And we're going to be using that in the clinic. We can print those kind of lift gates or lucidity, or we can have a, a stock of those. So you can buy them and you can have them in the clinic. Mm 
So, uh, and then we got others. If we keep the teeth apart and the patient, he's going to start deprogramming itself. But also you got brands like Aqualizer that they help to deprogram it. Anything that you place in between your teeth is going to do some sort of deprogramming because the muscle, they're not going to remember where they used to go if you have something in between your teeth. Mm -hmm. So okay. into the metals, the first one that I've designed is some sort of NTI. So the NTI is something that goes in the front, fairly easy. Mm, Medisplint allows you to just with AI to do this. Mm. I follow all the steps so you can understand what we need to do. But we need to have a lot of retention because we're only going to grab two to three teeth, Aww. sometimes four. So we need a lot of retention. Um, that's loading. <laughs> it's just you can't see the message in loading, but that's loading. Mm -hmm. So the the program is going to think, well, this needs to go here and it's going to give us some sort of um, design on where that uh, anterior NTI is going to go. Mm -hmm. That's simple. Then we can add the name. I like to have a name just so I know which one, which is the patient. This is just mine. <laughs> Yeah. That's my name. And then you can print directly this kind of uh, NTIs, but also sometimes some patients, they might clench it into this. So this little uh, surface can break. One of the things that you can do is add a bit mm -hmm. so you can give it an extra support. Yeah. So I'm just adding, it's just easily adding uh, with the adding tools. You can add anywhere. You can get added in the front. You can add in the occlusal surface. Here, I'm just kind of adding and smoothing, adding and smoothing. And at the end, you have some sort of anterior um, stop, mm -hmm. but with support. That support is important if the patient is going to bite a bit harder into that. Mm -hmm. Don't think the patient is going to hard too hard, bite too hard into this. You don't really need to do this. Mm -hmm. That's just give us an extra support. Yeah. There's just little tricks you can do. And so, you know, these kind of programs help you to change a few things if you like. Okay. So moving on to the B-splint. B-splint is something quite similar. Mm -hmm. Again, you click onto anterior bite in mm -hmm. um, splint, and then into manual creation. You can do a automatic, the problem with automatic is going to create something like the one we did before. Yeah. If we want to do a B-splint, we need to extend a bit towards the back. Mm. The B-splint, the difference here is say the patient can swallow this because it's small. Mm. So if you're worried that the patient is going to sleep with it and it's a small device, yeah. you can extend this kind of splint towards the back. Mm -hmm. So if it's big enough, the patient won't be able to swallow it. Yeah. And also, if there is not much retention, see, you can go towards the back. Mm -hmm. Just a few changes that, that you can do. Mm -hmm. This kind of video, they're not accelerated. They're just at the same speed as I'm doing it. So mm -hmm. if this video takes two minutes, that's the two minutes that it took me. Mm -hmm. This is not going any quicker. So... Sometimes you want to accelerate things because it's loading, but this kind of splint, because the computer doesn't need to think too much because mm -hmm. they're quite simple to do, uh, it's quite easy. So mm -hmm. once you've got the, roughly the idea, you can move into the next step. That's what mm -hmm. it takes to think of a design that you want to do. Have you seen this kind of splint before, uh, Jenny? Yeah, this kind of split is quite normal, right? Yeah. Mm. I, I think Medit is doing a great job uh, with the anterior bites. Not many programs that I've seen, you have that little mm -hmm. square in there. Oh. And I, I like it because it's flat. Mm -hmm. It allows me to have a flat surface. So what we don't want is having the teeth, the teeth form into these. Oh. So it needs to be as flat as possible so the patient can move freely mm. anywhere, to the left, to the right, or towards the front. Yeah. 
and you can add the name and again it's just the same you need a certain thickness i think this is 1.5 to 2 millimeters uh, so that you can print the material and it doesn't break mm. but you're not touching anything in the back you're only touching in the front yeah and then a coisty programmer it's just dr coist created this kind of um deep programmers the idea is the same you have an interior stop but it's just a way to hold it especially we're going to see it later on the coisty programmer just goes through the palette so if it goes through the palette you don't need the teeth say maybe you have restorations that are breaking maybe you have mm -hmm. certain teeth that are moving and you don't want to graft into any teeth so the good thing with this kind of device is it goes around the gums we can change the design slightly i think that that's loading again and then changing the design it's fairly easy. So you just need to tell the program, you drag the points, you bring that closer to the tooth. Yeah. Eventually, I think Medit is doing some, so many, uh, the feedback that we give, that we give, and then so many advancements and improvements. If we say, thanks to AI, really in not, no time, there's going to be one button that we click and it's going to create these kind of things. I think that things are moving really quick. So you can make a quality programmer with AI function, right? No? Not at the moment, but I think I'm really ah. sure I'm really close in the future. You can click to AI and it can give you some sort of quality programmer. Ah, this is yeah. manually done ah. um, because the program at the moment is not trained to do these kind of things uh, but if you do a hundred of these then the program knows how to do it and yeah. then it's, it's going to be possible soon and i think ai is taking over in many many things uh, and i think medit is doing an amazing job with an a with ai as well mm -hmm. yeah something like that so that goes around the gum wow. these are yeah. so different from the normal ones is it yeah not uncomfortable is it okay no, those, those kind of devices, they're not uncomfortable. Oh. So like movable dentures, they go into soft tissue, but yeah. it just grabs to the teeth and it, it's not, not uncomfortable at all. Oh. You don't need to wear this 24-7. Uh, mm. Sometimes you do, but not, not always. But the good thing with these kind of devices is because it's not wrapping the teeth, you can you can barely see it because it's in the back. Yeah. Mm. So it's, a, it's a bit more aesthetic as well. Yeah. So moving on to which one, so we, we saw three of them, there is others out there. Those are the ones that you can do with Medisplint, fairly easy. The most important part that we need to understand is, is it for short term or is it for long term use? If we're going to be using something for short term, I think we can use like a Lucy jig or a leaf gauge or like the NTIs, something that goes in the front. Um, and it's small because it's only for short term. But yeah. if the patient is going to sleep with it uh, mm -hmm. and it's going to be for a few weeks, then we need something more like a bisplink because mm -hmm. we want those teeth uh, to, to hold the teeth in the right position and then mm -hmm. to avoid the patient to swallow or lose it because sometimes you just lose this small bit when it's a bit bigger, it's a bit more difficult to lose it. But also, if we're going to be using this for a long term, we need to understand that the joints need to be healthy. So that's mm -hmm. the second part of this. If the joints are not healthy, we cannot use this uh, for a long mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So when we said when we want to use it, we also need to understand that the joints need to be healthy. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So the joints need to be healthy. Um, but there needs to be no pain in the joints. Okay, we're going to see on the patient expectation when uh, we need to remove it. But then we need to understand that if there is any temporal mandibular disorders, we need to take that out. Okay? What what kind of treatment should be done? So uh, we're going to see that, Jenny, as well. Um, but if we cannot use this kind of anterior bite, we need something like a full coverage, like the ones that we saw in another webinar. That's going to help with the joints. 
these kind of devices they don't help with the joint they're going to help with muscles but not really oh, the joint. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so talking about upper or lower mm, say we have really crowded teeth in the lower but we have really aligned teeth in the front then we might want to do a lower yeah uh, deep program instead on the top one because yeah. if we do a top one and the teeth are really crowded then it's not going to be even on the mm -hmm. platform that we created mm -hmm. so which one either top or bottom is going to depend as well on the antagonist that we have mm -hmm. if we have any partial dentures we don't want to have this device on top of a partial denture because at the end you're going to be removing this and removing the denture and you can break the uh, denture as well so i think it'll be easier to have it in the antagonist yeah but also if you have crowns or teeth that can that can break say a crown that can fall out or a tooth that's periocompromised that moving if you have a tooth that's mobile that has mobility in it yeah you don't want to clash against this platform say yeah. you haven't teeth with mobility three you don't want to be using this kind of devices yeah. either mm -hmm. you can use something different or place it in the lowest so you can hit the top you need to find an alternative to it um, yeah. so the process of doing this is the same that we saw in the first part we need the a scanner we need we can use the medit i700 i think the i900 is out there if we have it then we can use any scanner will work because the good thing with medit is at the moment we can use the apps but the good thing with Medit is you can record and we will see how the recording yeah. is going to help us integrate this at the very end. Mm. If we're going to be using another kind of scanners, then we're got, not going to have the recording uh, included. Mm. Then we can use the Medit Splint app and then we need a printer. Mm. Once we've got the printer, we can send this to a lab. They can do it for us. We have a printer, we can do it. That's depending on uh, whatever we got in the clinic. Mm. And then we can use these kind of resins. Keys, key Keysprint Soft works really nicely for me. If we want to polish them, we can use Keyprint Key Polish. That helps with the polishing of the splint. We're not going to produce it. You don't need this part. If you're going to produce it, this kind of material works really, really nicely. Mm. So in the patient expectation, what does the patient expect or need to expect when they're wearing this kind of device? It keeps going to the next presentation. I don't know why I'm not clicking anything. Yeah. So, so the patient expectations. So the patient, once they wear this kind of device, they need to think about what's going to happen. What do I need to feel? Or what do you need to tell them that can happen? Mm. The first thing that can happen is pain. So mm. the patient can experience pain. And that's important to know because we need to understand how to manage the pain. Or if we can use these kind of devices in the patients or not. So if the pain comes from tension in the muscle, that can be normal. Sometimes mm -hmm. they might feel, I never experienced this kind of tensions here and here. And sometimes it goes down. <laughs> in the neck. That, that can be normal because oh. some patients, and this is interesting, when you wear them, this, this kind of device, they're going to relax the muscle. But mm -hmm. that pain sometimes comes from patients getting used to the pain and they always they always been in pain. And then you give them this kind of device, they're starting to relax mm -hmm. and now they, they remove it and it's, oh, now it's painful. Now oh, it's painful. It was painful before, but you never notice because mm -hmm. the pain, you can manage the pain or you were used to the pain. So mm -hmm. that's the first kind of pain. It's more like a tension tenderness sort of thing in the muscles mm -hmm. but if that tension or tenderness comes in the joint which is a sharp kind of pain coming close to the ear mm -hmm. then we need to ask the patient to remove that immediately yeah so we need to tell them don't wear it bring them back um bring them back to the clinic maybe we need to change the sort mm -hmm. of thing that they're going to be using yeah mm -hmm. so also the second thing that can happen is uh, the muscle activity, we're going to reduce that muscle activity. So the patient can feel, and I have patients that their wife or their husband, they be like, well, his face is a bit more relaxed. I can mm -hmm. see his face. He's not like that. He's now, 
bit more like that. So we can see some facial relaxation and also the muscle activity is going to be reduced. Mm -hmm. So if the patient had some headaches coming from this area here, they might feel a bit better mm -hmm. thanks to these devices. Okay? So that you can tell the patient, well, this can happen. Also, and that's probably what we want these kind of devices for, is for the bite adjustment. So if the patient wears this, say for eight hours at night time, mm -hmm. once they wake up, they're not going to be able to bite in their position where they used to bite. Mm -hmm. So they're going to feel really weird. Yeah. And they're going to ask us, well, when I woke up, I had my breakfast and now I can't really bite. Mm -hmm. And then my bite is in the back teeth or I can only bite in one side because the joints yeah. are sitting and now the teeth don't really match. Mm. Well, after this, we need to think about some treatment that we need to do. Either, mm -hmm. like we said, big cases, full mouth rehabilitation, maybe orthodontics, and we need to align the teeth into the correct position. Or sometimes we need just to, I don't know, maybe give them a partial denture or depending on the case, we need to do an appropriate treatment plan. But we need to tell them your bite is going to change mm -hmm. and that's important. Mm -hmm. yeah? I think you got a question, Jenny? Yeah. So um, what if the patient has symptoms with the deep programmers? So they can have symptoms um, because of the load that we are applying in the joints. Mm -hmm. So if they have any pain, we need to ask them to take it out come back to the clinic as soon as possible. And then we need to see maybe changing that patient into a full coverage splint. Again, it's a broad topic and we're always talking about healthy joints. If the joints are not healthy, then that's, that's a different part of the presentation. Maybe we can do another webinar talking okay. about- uh, That one really will be also very interesting. But yeah, those are really difficult cases. Probably we need to, we can refer those kind of patients to the specialist. We're not really sure if the patient is feeling better with this kind of anterior bite. Maybe refer them. That's probably the best thing that we could do for them. Mm. No? Okay. Then uh, the why they have pain here sometimes is because there's not really um, a disc in between the joint and the oh. glenoid fossa. And then those patients are pressing against the retrodiscal tissue which can be quite sore. So it's important to know that if they have any pain in the joints, check it out. Mm. So moving on to integrate this, which is the, the bit that I like as a dentist, into a comprehensive treatment plan. Mm. I prepared just a simple case and a complex case. The simple one, we're going to talk through these kind of cases. So this is the patient came to the clinic. We recorded him uh, into this position, which is maximum intercuspation, so MI. So teeth are just together. But we can see this patient has a bit of wear. Mm -hmm. So this is a um, professional heavy lifter. He was always complaining about pain coming from here. Oh. Um, he had a lot of tension in the muscles. And then he was biting into that bite and it, well, that's my bite and it feels okay. That's what he thought. Mm -mm. So we gave him some sort of deep programmer. Mm -hmm. And after taking uh, just a week with these, we saw that the wisdom teeth are the oh, first teeth. Oh my God. The so ones the condyle is sitting, the correct bite of this patient is this one. <gasps> Problem is when he was trying to bite, he had to move forward to join the, the the jaw a lot to bring that into the correct position. That's why he had a lot of tension, a lot yeah. of tenderness in the muscles in the joint. So the only thing that we needed to do with him was to extract. Now we have mm -hmm. the extraction of the wisdom teeth. And now that's a different, completely different case because now the the patient is biting properly. Mm -hmm. All the symptom has disappeared and he feels a lot better. And mm -hmm. as we said, he's a professional heavy lifter. He needed to have, and he was clenching a lot when he was lifting. Mm -hmm. So now he uh, feels a lot better thanks to just really simple case 
where thanks to the deprogrammer, you can see where the bite of that patient was. And then we can do a treatment according to this. In this case, we just needed to remove the wisdom teeth. Yeah. In other cases, we need to do different case, this, different things. But it, this is just a really simple case that illustrates really well mm -hmm. how the deep programmer can help us. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And then into a really complex case, and this is a case that took me a few weeks to treat. It oh, wasn't really, yeah. it wasn't easy. But if you follow a protocol, I think you can do these kind of complex cases. Mm. The patient that comes in that has a lot of wear, that has mm -hmm. a lot of um, tooth surface lo tooth surface lost. Yeah. So you have over the years mm -hmm. he had some treatment done. He had a veneer in that lateral, mm -hmm. and then you want to restore this case. But if he's biting completely, you don't have space to restore him. So mm -hmm. you want to open the bite. And how much do you want do you want to open the bite? Before opening the bite, that just complicates everything. The first thing that I would do. Give them some sort of deprogrammer. Mm. So once they've got something, you can record a second bite. Yeah. So we give them this. Same case. We give them the deprogrammer. They wait for a week, sometimes yeah. less, sometimes more. We're going to go through that together. And then that's just how the jaw goes to a different position. That's a different position. And the implant that he had. No. This is not why it's in plaster. The first point of contact, the interference that he had, uh, was in the in the uh, implant. Mm. Sometimes an implant, an implant crown, and you're like, "Well, the patient is fine." Well, we need to make sure that the patient is fine, and I had to remove that uh, crown. Mm. So we did some restoration for him in the front, oh. but we right. And then you can see with the temporaries, I mean, this is a case that I could go on. It takes me 40 minutes just to talk about this case. It's a long case. Mm -hmm. But we did so uh, overlays in the back, uh, veneers overlays sort of thing. Yeah. And then we did some three quarters veneers in the front. Mm -hmm. Simple composite, the lowest. This is composite. But then we prepped mm -hmm. and we did uh, veneers porcelain veneers because it's a case that we wanted to have him stable in mm -hmm. a temporary phase sorry temporary phase and then move into a final case oh. and that took me weeks. so maybe i think even up to three months i think that case was how long should we wait for a deep programming so that can take i mean i have patients that in a week they're completely deprogrammed i have patients that in a few minutes, they are deprogrammed. So yeah. It does, yeah. It does depend. Oh, Let me yeah. stop the video because I can show you. Um, it it really depends on the patient mm, muscle activity. Is that no. like that? It's going to take a bit longer. But if oh, you okay. see them moves freely, maybe it's sometimes in five minutes, those patients are fully deprogrammed. Mm -hmm. More complex the patients are, the more um, they're going to need that deprogramming. Yeah. So it does depend on the patient, really. Mm, no, I see. So these kind of cases, the good thing with Medit as well is we, we can record the mandibular movements. And then we finished the case and we recorded the mandibular movements. And this helped me to understand that the patient now has a new bite and we reprogram the bite to be mm -hmm. in a different position mm -hmm. now this bite let me just press play this is the left laterality this is cane and guidance which help us a lot with uh, muscle activity as well mm -hmm. on the right on the right side he's class two i mean he's just skeletic uh, on the the jaw is smaller so skeletically it's a bit smaller mm -hmm. so i can't really have canine to canine contact so i had lateral here lateral mm -hmm. against canine so when i press play again oh sorry let me go back so when we have 
Okay, at the moment we've got the left side. Then we've got the right side. This is lateral against canine. Yeah. I think I, I tried to do like a group function with the with the premolar as well. Yeah. And then we got the anterior. Yeah. We don't have any prematurities in the back. Yeah. And we can make sure that there is no teeth catching in the back thanks to yeah. this as well. Yeah. What we done with this kind of this this patient with a heavy braxer. What we've done with the full case, and I want to protect my work, everything that I've done, the veneers that I've done. Again, we've done this in the first webinar. We can do a full full mouth coverage um, splint on the top or on the lower, and that's going to protect the job that we've done. Yeah? Yeah. So talking about deep programming, and this is answering a bit more about your question. How long? <laughs> How long is the oh. question that I get asked a lot? And uh, it's really difficult to point at the patient that they are going to deprogram really quick. I think with experience, you can get to understand, okay, this patient now is deprogrammed. But if you are unsure and the, the, the joints are healthy, I'll say keep the patient a bit longer. Mm. Because it's not going to cause any harm if the joints are healthy. Yeah, we want to deprogram the patient. We want to mm, make those those muscles forget where they are used to go on everyday basis where they chew in. It can take few few minutes. It can take a couple of days. It can take a couple of weeks. That depends on the patient. And then we need to do something about it because if we don't do anything about it, then the patient is going to feel like his bite is always off. That can lead to orthodontics, that can lead to just a simple equilibration, that can lead to a complex case. Uh, sometimes you can just do some table stops in the back. There's so many different treatment plans that we could talk in a different webinar about yeah. how many treatments we can do about those kinds of deprogrammed patients. And I have many cases that I've treated with different techniques, and we mm -hmm. can see all the from. And then we need to reprogram the patients. No our job to just deeper and uh, reprogram them. But if we give them a stable bite with posterior discussion, uh, with an anterior bite in harmony with the envelope of function, so we're going to have the patient um, protecting his, his own bite, protecting his own teeth. Mm. If we have training guidance, then the muscle activity lowers a lot. Mm. As a conclusion and some recommendations, if we can have some, um, I think deep programmers can help a lot, but we need to know exactly when to use them. But yeah. it can help us with diagnosis. It can help us to know if the joints are healthy or not. It can help us with the pain and the tension that we got in the muscles. Patients do get better um, talking about muscles when we use this. Uh, it helps us as a starting point if we have don't have an idea of where we want to start, if we have a big case, I don't know, do we have to open the bite here, here, here? Yeah. I'm not too sure. As a starting point, it's really good. With heavy bruxes, if you have a, a patient that they know or their partners at home, yeah, you can hear that patient that goes to left, right, they clench a lot. This helps a lot with clenches. This helps a lot with uh heavy bruxes as, as well mm. but again, if we want to use them as a long term maybe we need to consider something different yeah? mm -hmm. and then this helps with headaches headaches not migraines like the migraines that we can locate here in the front but more headaches that goes in the back like here and mm -hmm. on the side sorry yeah? we have various options we've seen them it's the same idea it's something an interior in the front something in the front to keep the teeth apart. We need to manage the patient expectation. Patients don't know and don't understand what's going to happen if they wear this or not. And then we've seen how we can integrate this in a bigger treatment plan. That That's the whole goal, really. We can help the patient with pain, but really this helps us to deprogram the patient, but we need to reprogram it later. If we're going to just deprogram the patient, what what's the point, really? That's, 
-hmm. just the why would we do that yeah. and then deep programming it, it's only temporary but it's a is an important step as a, as a big treatment plan yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so thank you very much jenny uh this is my oh. email if you wants to send me an email uh with questions about this really happy we'll answer them um if you have any questions jenny i'm here to ask any questions that you have as well um, I asked every question that I wanted to know between the lectures. It was really interesting to see all the cases. It was real case of yours, right? So yes, so those cases I've cheated them uh, here in the practice. Actually, yeah. one of them, uh, his name is Hector because he's my father. So oh, that's uh, really? that took me that took me a while to do uh, three months. Oh. But his name is Hector, like me. Uh, I think in Spain we like to be called as our parents. If I I don't have kids, but if I have kids, maybe. <laughs> one of them would be called Hector as well. Yeah. Okay, so that's everything about today, right? Yes, I think the, we covered the deep programmers. Um, let's wait for the feedback as well, see what people think about these kind of things. If we have any deeper questions into anterior deep programmers, we can talk a bit more about it. We're yeah. going to move into achievement cases. We can prepare another webinar. That's no problem with me. Well, wow. okay. Thank you for um, preparing a, such a great lecture for today. So that's You're all right for today. So yeah, see you next time. Thank you for being here, doctor. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye.